Are you ready for the end? The big conclusion. The ground was soft by the time stop perimeter. Half a millennium's bad drainage from the medieval walls had transformed the foundations into a virtual bog. So that was where mulch surfaced. The soft ground wasn't the only reason for choosing that exact spot. The other reason was the smell. A good tunnel dwarf can pick up the scent of gold through a half a mile of granite bedrock. Mulch Diggums had one of the best noses in the business. The hover trolley floated virtually unguarded. Two of Retrieval's finest were stationed behind the recovered ransom, but at that moment they were having a little giggle at their stricken commander. He can't have chuck it, can he, Chicks? Chicks nodded, mimicking Root's spewing technique. Chicks verbals, Chicks verbals pantomime antics provided the perfect cover for a spot of pilfering. Mulch gave his tubes a clearing before clamoring from the tunnel. The last thing he needed was for a sudden burst of gas to alert the LEP to his presence. He needn't have worried. He could have slapped Chick's verbal in the face with a wet stinkworm and the Sprite wouldn't have noticed. In a matter of seconds, he had transferred two dozen ingots into the, ingots into the tunnel. It was the easiest job he had ever pulled. Mulch had to stifle a giggle <clears throat> as he dropped the last two bars down the hole. Julius had really done him a favor, getting him involved in this whole affair. Things couldn't have worked out much better. He was a free bird, rich, and best of all, presumed dead. By the time the LEP realized that the gold was missing, Malt Diggums would be half a continent away, if they realized it all. The dwarf lowered himself into the ground. It would take several trips to move his treasure trove, but it would be worth a delay. With this kind of money, he could take an early retirement. He would have to completely disappear, of course, but a plan was already forming for that in his devious mind. He would live above ground for a spell, masquerade as a human dwarf, <clears throat> one with an aversion to light. Perhaps by a penthouse with thick blinds, in Manhattan perhaps, or Monte Carlo. It might seem odd, of course, a dwarf shutting himself away from the sun, but then again, he would be an obscenely rich dwarf. And humans will accept any story, however outlandish, when there's something in it for them, and preferably something that's green and folds. Artemis could hear a voice calling his name. There was a face behind the voice, <clears throat> but it was blurred, hard to make out. His father, perhaps? Father? The words sounded strange in his mouth, unused, rusty. Artemis opened his eyes. Butler was leaning over him. Artemis, you're awake. Ah, Butler, it's you. Artemis got to his feet, head spinning with the effort. He expected Butler's hand at his elbow to steady him, but it didn't come. Juliet was lying on a chaise lounge, dribbling onto the cushions. Obviously, the draft hadn't worn off yet. It was just sleeping pills, Butler, harmless. The manservant's eye had a dangerous glint. Explain yourself. Artemis rubbed his eyes. Later, Butler, I'm feeling a bit... Butler stepped into his path. Artemis, my sister is lying drugged on that couch. She was almost killed. So you'll explain yourself now. Artemis realized that he'd been given an order. He considered being offended, then decided that perhaps Butler was right. He had gone a little bit too far. I didn't tell you about the sleeping pills because you'd fight them. It's only natural. And it was imperative to the plan that we all go to sleep immediately. The plan. Artemis lowered himself into a comfortable chair. <clears throat> the time field was the key to this whole affair. It's the LEP's ace in the hole. It's what has made them unbeatable for all these years. Any incident can be contained. That and the biobomb make a formidable com uh, combination. So why did we have to be drugged? Artemis smiled. Look out the window. Don't you see? They're gone. It's over. Butler glanced through the net curtains. The light was bright and clear, not a hint of blue. Nevertheless, the manservant was unimpressed. They're gone for now. They'll be back tonight. I guarantee it. No. That's against the rules. We beat them. That's it. Game over. Butler raised an eyebrow. The sleeping pills, Artemis? Ah, not to be distracted, I see. Butler's answer was implacable silence. The sleeping pills, very well. I had to think of a way to escape the time field. I trawled through the book, but there was nothing, not a clue. The people themselves have not yet developed a way. So I went back to their Old Testament, back when their lives and ours were intertwined. You know the stories, elves that made shoes during the night, sprites that cleaned houses. Back when we coexisted to a certain extent, magical favors in exchange for their fairy forts. The big one, of course, Santa Claus. Butler's eyebrows nearly jumped off the front of his face. Santa Claus? 
Artemis raised a smile. I know, I know, I was skeptical. But apparently our little corporate image Santa Claus is not descended from a Turkish saint. He is actually the shadow of San de Class, the third king of the Frond Elfin dynasty. He is also known as San the Deluded. Not a great title, as titles go. Admittedly, de Class thought that the greed of the mud people in his kingdom could be assuaged by distributing lavish gifts. He would marshal all the great wizards once a year and have them throw up a great time stop over vast regions. So Christmas Eve, there's a great time stop over the world, which helps Santa Claus deliver expensive and lavish gifts. Flocks of sprites would be sent out to deliver the presents while the humans were asleep. Of course it didn't work. Humans' greed can never be assuaged, especially not by gifts. Butler frowned. What if the humans, we, that is, what if we had woken up? Yes, excellent question. The heart of the matter, humans wouldn't wake up. That is the nature of the time stop. Whatever your state of consciousness is going in, that's how you stay. Humans can neither wake up nor fall asleep. You must have noticed the fatigue in your bones these last few hours, yet your mind would not let you sleep. Butler nodded. Things were getting clearer in a roundabout sort of way. So my theory was that the only way to escape the time field was to simply fall asleep. Our own consciousness was all that was keeping us imprisoned. You risked an awful lot on theory, Artemis. Well, not just a theory. We did have a test subject. Who? Oh, Angeline? Yes, my mother. Because of her drug-induced slumber, she moved with the natural order of time, unhindered by the time field. If she had not, I would have simply surrendered to the LEP and submitted to their mind wipe. Butler snorted. <laughs> he doubted that. So because we could not fall asleep naturally, I simply administ administered us all a dose of mother's pills. Simple. You cut it pretty fine though. Another minute. Oh, I agreed. The boy nodded. Things were tense there at the end. It was necessary in order to double bluff the LEP. He paused so that Butler could process the information. Well, am I forgiven? Butler sighed. On the chaise lounge, Juliet snored like a drunken sailor. He smiled suddenly. Yes, Artemis, all is forgiven. Just one thing. Yes. Never again. Fairies are too human. You're right, said Artemis, the crow's feet deepening around his eyes. Never again. We shall restrict ourselves to more tasteful ventures in the future. Legal? No, I can't promise that. Butler nodded. It was close enough. Now, young master, shouldn't we check on your mother? Artemis grew paler, if that were possible. Could the captain have reneged on her promise? She would certainly be entitled to. Yes, I suppose we should. Let Juliet rest, she's earned it. He cast his eyes upward along the stairs. It had been too much to hope for that he could trust the fairy. After all, he had held her captive against her will. He berated himself silently. Imagine parting with all those millions for the promise of a wish. Oh, the gullibility. But then the loft door opened. Butler drew his weapon instantly. Artemis, behind me, intruders. The boy waved him away. No, Butler, I don't think so. His heart pounded in his ears. Blood pulsed in his fingertips. Could it be? Could it possibly be? A figure appeared on the stairs, wraith-like in her towel robe, her hair wet from the shower. Artie, she called. Artie, are you there? Artemis wanted to answer. He wanted to race up the grand stairway, arms outstretched, but he couldn't. His cerebral functions had deserted him. Angeline Fowl descended, one hand resting lightly on the banister. Artemis had forgotten how graceful his mother was. Her bare feet skipped over the carpeted steps and soon she was standing beside him. Morning, darling, she said brightly as though it were just another day. M mother stammered Artemis. Well, come on, give me a hug. Artemis stepped into his mother's embrace. It was warm and strong. She was wearing perfume. He felt like the young boy that he was. I'm sorry, Artie, she whispered into his ear. Sorry for what? For everything. For the last few months, I haven't been myself, but things are going to change. Time to stop living in the past. Artemis felt a tear on his cheek. He wasn't sure whose tear it was. And I don't have a present for you. A present, said Artemis. Of course, sang his mother spinning around him. Don't you know what day it is? Day? It's Christmas Day, you silly boy. Christmas Day. Presents are traditional, are they not? Yes, thought Artemis, traditional. 
Santa Claus. And look at this place, drab as a mausoleum. Butler! The manservant hurriedly pocketed his six hour. Yes, ma'am. Get on the phone to Brown Thomas. The platinum set number. Reopen my account. Tell Helene I want a Yuletide makeover. The works. Yes, ma'am, the works. Oh, and wake up, Juliet. I want my things moved into the main bedroom. That attic is far too dusty. Yes, ma'am. Right away, ma'am. Angeline Fowl linked her son's arm. Now, Artie, I want to know everything. First of all, what happened here? Um, remodeling, said Artemis. The old doorway was riddled with damp. Angeline frowned, completely unconvinced. I see. And how about school? Have you decided on a career? While his mouth answered these everyday questions, Artemis's mind was in turmoil. He was a boy again. His life was going to change utterly. His plans would have to be much more devious than usual if they were to escape his mother's attention, but it would be worth it. Angeline Fowl was wrong. She had brought him a Christmas present. Now there's an epilogue, and just like it's important to read a prologue to know what happens before the story is told, the epilogue gives you some information for after that you'll want to know going into the next books. And believe me, you're gonna to wanna to read the next books. Epilogue. <clears throat> now that you have reviewed the case file, you must realize what a dangerous creature this fowl is. There is a tendency to romanticize Artemis, to attribute to him qualities that he does not possess. The fact that he used his wish to heal his mother is not a sign of affection. He did it simply because the social services were already investigating his case, and it was only a matter of time before he was put into foster care. He kept the existence of the people quiet only so that he could continue to exploit them over the years, which he did on several occasions. His one mistake was leaving Captain Short alive. Holly became the LEP's foremost expert in the Artemis Fowl cases and was invaluable in the fight against the people's most feared enemy. This fight was to continue across several decades. Ironically, the greatest triumph for both protagonists was the time they were forced to cooperate during the Goblin Insurgents, but that's another story. Report compiled by Dr. J. Argon, B. Psych for the LEP Academy Files. Details are 94% accurate, 6% unavoidable extrapolation. The end. Oh man, so much to process there. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on the book and what do you think will happen to Artemis, how you think he's going to exploit the people moving forward, and what is gonna happen with his dad. And even more than that, I cannot wait till this streams on Disney Plus because we're about to zoom and hate on the fact that they changed the plot completely. For this entire book and the entire next book, Holly Short hates Artemis. Yet in the trailer for the movie, She's like his best little friend. I honestly don't know if I can watch. Maybe if we watch it together, it'll be okay. Happy reading. <laughs>